I walked away from the tree toward Emma and Joy as melodic formants whirled around in my head. A serene smile still streaked Joy's glowing face. Emma's smile, however, was gone. In its place was a deep look of concern and, despite her obvious attempt to hide it, fear. She told me we had to go into the house right away. Something awful was about to happen. We sat in front of the television all night. Nothing was abnormal. I was getting a little anxious. Emma's vague, pretentious statement alone was enough to cause concern. But flashes of lightning hinted at a coming storm which only added to the atmosphere. Leaving my spot on the couch, I walked tentatively to the large windows facing the woods. More lightning. Long, thunderless flashes which caused the trees to cast ghostly, distorted shadows. I was reminded of the times I saw the wreathing atrocities in the lightning bolts back in Florida. The lightning here was different, though. I never saw any individual bolts, and the illumination it gave off seemed to last much longer. I fell asleep in front of the TV with Joy and Emma. When I woke up the next morning, Emma was still there on the couch with us. She insisted that we stay in the living room, glued to the TV, until she knew the source of the terrible feeling of dread that she'd felt since the previous day. But the day went by and nothing happened, and it was pretty much the same for the next day and till the early evening. Whatever boring thing we had been watching on the TV was replaced by an NBC news brief about an explosion in the USSR. The news claimed that radiation had even been detected in Sweden. Emma nodded gravely and told me that this is what she'd been worrying about. When I asked her how she knew, she didn't answer. All she told me is that we were far away and we had nothing to worry about, even if the news said anything otherwise. The next morning, it was on every channel and in every newspaper. A power plant called Chernobyl had exploded and spread radioactive materials all over an enormous area. None of the experts were willing to claim that Europe would be safe. No one even said there wasn't a chance that the wind could take it across the Atlantic over to us. But still, Emma remained calm and confident as she insisted that we'd be safe. For the first time in months, I saw a slim tendril of bleeding muscle squirm out of the left corner of the room, only to retreat a few seconds later. Joy giggled in my ear. I took her from my shoulder and held her in front of my face. She was staring at the same corner I was. The day dragged on and Emma remained fixated on the television. I asked her if she'd mind if I went for a walk. No further than the tree, I told her. She said that was fine, so I grabbed my jacket and left. Spring had melted the snowpack but had yet to take away the chill from the air. I stuffed my hands in my pocket and walked a straight line toward the tree. Deep mud clung to my ankles as I trudged across the clearing. I remembered Emma telling me how the Native Americans thought the area was an important spot. I stopped in the center of the clearing and looked around. There wa- There wasn't really anything noteworthy to see. It might have been a hundred feet across with thick groups of white birch and oak trees surrounding it. Fifty or so feet inside the tree line stood the remains of an old stone wall which Emma had claimed the local tribe had built hundreds of years ago. Icy wind whipped through the clearing as the surrounding treetops swayed. I looked up at the graying sky. Flurries were in the forecast for later that evening. But I wouldn't have been surprised if they started to fall right then. I made my way across the clearing to the tree. It stood just as it did the last time. A black, bulbous object studded with countless spiny branches and sticks. I placed myself in front of the spot where I saw the eyes. No eyes could be seen. Not even slits where they should open. I ran my hands over the scarred bark. It felt smooth, despite the blemishes, and warm as well. As I inspected the surface of the tree, a staggeringly powerful taste of salt entered my mouth. It was awful. I craved water or juice or anything to get rid of the terrible desiccating sensation. I turned around and I was ready to walk back toward the house when the branches reached out for me. Before I could jump out of the way, I was grabbed and pulled face first against the surface of the tree. Screaming and struggling, I tried to free myself from its grasp, but the taste in my mouth grew even stronger as I began to choke. 
As the pressure grew, I could feel my cheekbone and ribs straining against the force. And then, everything went black. But I didn't lose consciousness. I was free to move, but it was like I was floating in space. I spun and kicked and tried to run, only to remain in the same empty spot. The pressure was gone. The cold wind was gone. The vile, salty taste was gone. Aside from my fear, all I felt was warmth. A moment later, I heard the long-lost voice of my friend. Her voice came through the empty space like wind chimes on a calm day. This time, I could understand each word. I miss you. I miss you and I hate myself for failing you. Even in the maternal warmth of the space I occupied, her words chilled me and forced goose flesh to rise on my skin. There is so little I can do for you now. So little help I can provide. I tried to ask her what she was talking about, but I couldn't open my mouth. My feeling wasn't uncomfortable. It was just strange. It was as if I had no mouth at all. All I could do was listen. You need to see what lies ahead. And only after you see will you be ready to learn. At that moment, an immersed, incomprehensibly vast field of stars exploded into my view. The light was so intense, brighter than anything I knew could exist. Looking down, I noticed I could see my own body. The nurturing warmth of the area I occupied kept me calm as I gazed out across the millions upon millions of stars. I bathed in a womb of lights. After an uncountable amount of moments, things changed. Starting at the edges where I could see and gradually moving inward, stars went black. Slowly and with growing speed, each pinprick of fire was smothered. With every snuffed light, the temperature dropped. Astonishingly potent fear gripped me as more and more and more of beautiful lights were cut from the sky. Cold set in. It was the type of cold for which I have no words other than those which describe death. But not familiar human death. Cosmic death. The icy starless void disappeared and I found myself on the forest floor staring up at the clouds. The black woman's musical voice filled my mind. Everything you do from now on must be for joy. Keep her safe and show her love. It's up to you to give her a purpose. I gagged as the hideous taste of salt overpowered my mouth. Take it, take, take it, take it easy. Take it easy on the truth, sir. No more, mm -hmm. no more of that. We're uh, live. Um, <clears throat> and there, kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta. And I like midget porn. Ooh. Mm -mm. Hi there, kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta. And I'm a Russian spy. Dosvedonia. Ooh. Hi there, kids, I'm Mr. Creepypasta. And I just poop myself. Everybody has like, whoa, just? Hey there, kids. I'm Mr. Creepypasta. And sometimes, when nobody's looking, I, I go to the dog park and I, I sniff the dog's butts. Hi there, kids. I'm Mr. Creepypasta. And I'm a cam model. Ties ribbons to his penis and dances to Taylor Swift. <laughs> <laughs> this is getting sad. You're not even just saying things, you're just coming to self realizations and just like not wanting to be here. <laughs> hey there, kids. I'm Mr. Creepypasta. And my mother once told me I was adopted. <laughs> Hi there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta. And I'm Vincent Vinacava. 
And today we're here to talk to you about the Creepypasta comic book. You guys have probably heard us talk about it before when it first went to Kickstarter. Well, now it's available for everybody and not just the backers. April 7th on Amazon. Follow the link. Supplies are limited. Very limited, in fact. But you don't want to miss out on this. And it's also going to be the start of the Spooktacular this year. So you'll be able to find out what actually happened to him, whose body was stolen by Bizarro, and me, who's still stuck in the deep web. Oh, yeah! I don't know. I just thought it was like... I just thought do that. Like it was like a catchphrase. Oh, yeah! Snap into a Slim Jim! <coughs> Dig it! Ah, welcome. I take it you've come for a story. Of course you did. Why else would you have tracked down my website? After all, it takes a very special browser to even locate this dark little corner of the internet. But you already knew that. So, if it's a story you want, it's a story you shall receive. And it would please me very much to read one to you this evening. All of you. Shall we begin? I've got the perfect one in mind. It's a tale about those who've been wronged and the depths they'll sink to in the name of revenge. The Creepypasta comic is available on Amazon April 7th.